So this sermon started with just a small bit of a problem. It's a small letter. It's fitting to have a small problem. But it began because I was looking for something to preach on between what we just did and Lent, which is coming up in two weeks. And I figured, well, this is a small book, small period of time. This will work. One chapter. And so I sat down to start looking at this small book, and I couldn't find it. You know what you do when you can't find a book in the Bible? You kind of flip through and try to find it? I couldn't do that either. I had to get out the index to find Philemon. And so now I can tell you, it's right before Hebrews. That's where Philemon's at. So if you have a Bible, you can get it out and follow along, and that's where you'd look. It's the book before the book of Hebrews, which is large enough you're not going to miss that. (laughs) So we're going to look at Philemon, this one little itty-bitty little letter. And I've never studied it till this this run at it. So uh, it turns out that this little letter actually addresses something rather big. It's uh, there's a big sort of drama going on in, in as we read this letter, and the drama is going on between three people. It's a drama between Paul, the founder of the ch- of most of the churches in the New Testament period, especially of this church, the church at Colossae, where this is all happening. This is a, the letter to the Colossians. That's the, that's what this church is. So we have Paul, the founder of the church at Colossae. We have Philemon, for whom this book is named. He is one of the leaders at the church at Colossae. And we have Onesimus, a slave of Philemon. And so as we look at this drama between Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, the slave, we can guess at a few things about the story thus far. We can guess that Paul and Philemon probably knew each other rather well. Paul started the church, and then he was uh, the head leader of the church, and then Philemon becomes a leader. And when you're leading a church together and you're starting a new church, you spend a lot of time together. You go through some, some struggles, some stress. So they're not, they're not acquaintances. They've been in the trenches together. They're, they're tight. Moreover, we can be fairly certain that Paul would have been one of the people to pick the leaders of that church. So not only are Paul and Philemon experienced and, and they've worked together, Paul is a leader, or Philemon is a leader because Paul picked him to be a leader. And so Paul trusts Philemon and Philemon knows it. Now thinking about this a bit more, Philemon became a leader in the church either while owning at least one slave or while being okay in owning slaves. We don't know if he bought a slave after Paul left, or whether he had slaves when Paul made him a leader. But either way, Paul made someone a leader in the church who was okay owning slaves. Interesting thing, isn't it? And so Paul leaves, moves on to the next church, start to start another church, another community. And Philemon stays in Colossae and, and is serving the church there and owning slaves, owning this fellow named Onesimus. And Onesimus is not Christian. And then one day Onesimus goes, poof, and he's gone. We don't know why he leaves. It could be that he cuts and runs. He, he's a farmer, and, uh, a hired hand in the field, and he just starts walking down the road one day and never comes back. Or it could be that Onesimus was more of a trained uh, slave. Uh, Often slaves were trained to be accountants or teachers or musicians or artists. And and as a trained slave, you might be sent to do business on behalf of your master. And so it could be Onesimus was sent off to be entrusted with a task and then just didn't come home. Either way, Onesimus is gone, and somehow Onesimus ends up hanging out with Paul. Paul is under house arrest there. He's a, he's a, he's a citizen of Rome, or a citizen of the Roman Empire, so he, he's not going to be like shackled and put into a, a dingy, dark stone prison. But he's not going anywhere. He's waiting for transport to Rome at this point for, for trial. And so he's hanging out in this house, under house arrest, and he meets Onesimus. And somehow it works out that... He uh, is, gets to know Onesimus. Onesimus starts helping Paul, and, and Paul is able to say to him, have you ever heard of this dude, Jesus? You might want to. And Onesimus hears about him and decides, you know what, that sounds like something I'd like to do. And, and so he becomes Christian. He starts to follow Jesus. He finds salvation in this way. And at some point along the way, they have one of those it's a small world moments you meet you know when you meet someone and it's you're like your third cousin from Chicago or something like that and you never met him before they have one of those moments where uh, 
Paul is talking to an Onesimus, and Onesimus is saying, yeah, I ran away. I was a slave of this guy named Philemon. And Paul perks up and says, Philemon? I know a Philemon. Is it, is it this one? Yes, it is that Philemon. Ooh, that would have been an amusing moment, wouldn't it? When, when they realize that Paul trusts Philemon, this is Philemon's slave. Now, now Philemon's slave is hanging out with Paul. What's going to happen next? Now, Paul has the obvious thing he wants to do. He wants to hold on to Onesimus. He's living up to his name, right? He's being useful. Paul's under house arrest. It's, it's convenient to have someone to help you when you're under house arrest. But Paul has to figure out what he's going to do. And what he does is he asks Onesimus to go back. He makes this sacrifice. He will sacrifice the help of Onesimus. And he can't force Onesimus to go back, just like he won't force Philemon to do what is right. But he sits down and they, they drink coffee, or whatever the first century version of drinking coffee is. And uh, they decide Onesimus should go back, and he goes back. But he does not go back empty-handed. He goes back with this letter, the, this, this really short letter that we read right here. And it's 25 verses of what Paul had to write. And it's an amazing letter for two reasons, because it has to do two very different things. The first thing it has to do is to get Onesimus back safely. He's a runaway slave, right? He can't just waltz down the road and not worry about anything. If he is pulled, well, not so much pulled over. If, if a Roman legionary takes an interest in him and, and finds out he's a runaway slave, he's going to be in some trouble. And so this letter has to serve as sort of guarantee of his safe travel. It has to serve as the guarantee, yes, I'm a runaway slave, but here it is. Here's the letter from a, a citizen of Rome set, telling you what I'm doing. I'm going back to my master, so chillax. Don't, don't arrest me. Let me by. And, and so if this is what the, the letter has to do, it has to get him back safely. It has to be vanilla enough that no one reading it as a Roman soldier would, would pick out any hint that th there's anything illegal or hinky going on here. It has to be absolutely vanilla. That's the first thing it has to do. But the letter has to do a second thing as well. The letter also has to guide how Philemon and Onesimus interact with each other. Because there's going to be this awkward moment when Onesimus knocks on the door, and Philemon opens the door, and they see each other, and ain't that going to be an awkward moment. And Onesimus hands him the letter, and what happens next is going to be based upon how good is Paul at guiding what Philemon does next without giving away the game to any soldier who might read the letter as Onesimus is heading home. And so this is what he writes. It, it really is a masterpiece of, of subtle and sometimes not so subtle persuasion. It's, what Paul writes is he first he starts out by greeting Philemon and Aphia and Archippus, these other two leaders in the church. He says, and greet the entire church, right? And, and Though the letter is not written to the entire church, it would only be read by Philemon, it, it kind of starts out by reminding him what the context is here. It's like walking up to someone and saying, hey, mayor, or hey, officer, or hey, teacher, instead of saying the name. If someone walks up to me and says, hey, pastor, as opposed to saying, hey, Andy, that sets off a different response, doesn't it? If you're coming to me and saying, hey, pastor, you're reminding me you're a pastor, Andy. Get ready to be pastoral. Whereas if you come up and say, hey, Andy, you might get a little bit different of a response. That's what Paul's doing here. Hey, hey, leader in the church. You're a leader. Now let's talk about this. And then Paul becomes very gracious. He says, you know, I remember you and my prayers. Now good you are to other Christians and how much you serve. And, and it's just wonderful how wonderful you are. He, he is buttering him up. He is being gracious himself so that Paul can then turn it on Philemon and ask Philemon to be equally gracious in just a few minutes. And then Paul brings up the real issue. He says, you know, I've sent you Onesimus. I've sent you this, this slave, and I can tell you what to do, but I'm going to ask, you know me, Paul, little old me, I'm in jail, an old man in jail. You couldn't say no to me, right? He's turning on the pity fountain, right? He's, you can't say no to a little old man in jail. It's like your grandpa saying no to your grandpa. It's hard to do. And, and he continues saying, you know, Onesimus, he's living up to his name. He's being useful. 
He's being really useful. He was useless to you. He was useless to me. But now he's being useful because he follows Jesus with us. He has become very useful. And Paul says, you know, and I'd love to keep him with me because he's just so very, very useful. Just... He, he is serving me just like you used to serve me, Philemon. Remember those days back when you used to serve me and we were serving the church together? That's what Onesimus is doing here with me right now. And that's got to start messing with Philemon, doesn't it? Because now instead of seeing Onesimus as a slave, he's starting to see him as another leader in the church, which is not something Philemon's ever seen before. But Paul adds, you know, I... I wish I could hold on to him, but I don't want to force you into doing something, even if you should. I'm not going to force you into doing it. And, and this is the, sort of the subtlety of the argument. It's, it's like if one of you owes me $100, and I find a $100 bill with your name on it, what do I do? Do I hold on to it because you owe me $100? Or do, do I give it back to you, knowing that you should immediately turn around and give it back to me? That's what Paul's doing here. You know, you owe me. You owe your salvation to me. You owe me everything. Here, I'm giving you back this. Don't forget you owe me. And so he hands Onesimus back to Philemon and continues and says, you know, maybe this, maybe this is why he ran away. This, maybe this is God's plan. He ran away so that he might meet me and become useful. He might meet me and decide to follow Jesus. And now that's God's plan. And now he is not just a slave he is a brother to you. You should treat him like a brother. Verse 16, treat him like a brother. And if you read between the lines, and, and it seems to say, and you wouldn't want to make your brother a slave, would you? Would you? <laughs> so if you consider me your partner, if you consider me, Paul, to whom you owe everything, Welcome Enismus as you'd welcome me. Welcome him as if you'd welcome me, Paul. If I showed up the way you'd roll out the red carpet and put on a big fellowship meal and have a big celebration, treat Onesimus in the exact same way. This echoes back to verse 7. Remember when he talks about how gracious Philemon is and he, he sort of tells Philemon, it's, how, it's wonderful how well you treat fellow believers. Oh look, here's a fellow believer. I hope you, I hope you treat him well. There's one last thing Paul says about this, and it becomes the most important statement in the entire book. He says, if Onesimus owes you anything, I'm writing a blank check to cover it. Now, isn't that a statement, right? He says, see, I write this in my own hand. If he owes you anything, if he ran off with money, I'll cover it. If, if you feel like you've lost something because of Onesimus' value, if it cost you so much money to buy him, I'll cover that. If you feel like you've lost money because he hasn't been working for you and you've lost something, I'll cover that because I'm going to sacrifice what it takes so that you can see him as a brother, not as a slave. This is the moment when the gospel comes through in this letter. Because the gospel is that Jesus sacrificed himself for us, for the good of others. And this is the moment in which Paul practices the gospel. If there's a debt here, I will sacrifice to cover it. And when Paul makes that move, I will pay this man's debt, he's inviting Philemon to do the same. I've made my sacrifice, now it's time for you to follow Jesus and make yours. You had a slave, could you make the sacrifice and instead have a brother? And so after this, we have some closing comments. I'm going to come and see you. Keep on praying for me. Grace and peace be with you and yours. And, and then that, that's the end of this little letter. Far from being some sort of throwaway letter, a mere afterthought, something we can just skip by and... and, and something hard to find but easily overlooked. What we find in this letter is that it is a practical example of how the gospel works in everyday life. One person offering a great sacrifice, I will cover his debt, Paul says, making that sacrifice for the good of another, and then inviting someone else to do the same. If Philemon is willing to sacrifice in the same way that Paul is, imagine what can happen next. And the biggest challenge then for Philemon, after he reads this letter, is a challenge of imagination. It's a challenge of imagination, because what has Philemon seen whenever he's looked at Onesimus? Right? He's seen a tool. It's like he bought a car. It's like he went to the lot, and he sized up the tools, the cars he could buy, and he said, well, low mileage. 
good shape, I'll buy that one. And he brought Onesimus home and he used him like a tool. You give him an oil change every once in a while, you make sure, I mean, but you don't really... You, Philemon has been seeing Onesimus as a thing. And what Paul has invited him to do is see Onesimus as not just a person, but a brother. A brother in Jesus Christ. And so the challenge for Philemon is, can you imagine seeing Onesimus as something different than you've seen him before? And that becomes one of the biggest challenges of this letter for us. Can we imagine seeing people differently than we usually do? You know, we all have these caller IDs on our cell phones. And, and you know the person, you pick up your cell phone, and you see that name, and you think, Ugh. Can you imagine smiling when you see that number instead? Can you imagine the person you least want to have walk into the room? Can you imagine the, a time coming when you would stand up and wave them over to sit with you? If you can think of the person that you, uh, you would never trust, can you imagine a time when you would hand them your credit card? That strikes close to home, doesn't it? <laughs> can you think of a person you've never seen as an adult? Can you imagine a time when you would follow them, not just as a, a companion, but as a leader? That's a challenge, right? To imagine seeing people differently. It turns out that Philemon could imagine this. And the reason we know that Philemon could imagine this is because we still have the letter. If Philemon had opened this letter and looked at it and said, that's a nice thought, Paul, but he's mine, rip. We wouldn't have this, would we? But we do have it because it did work. Philemon was able to imagine the world differently. We have this, and there might be another reason we have it too. I'm going to tell you a series of facts, and we'll make of it what we make of it, but let me tell you a series of facts. It is a fact that the letters of Paul were put together at the end of the first century in Ephesus. It is a fact that there's a dude named Ignatius who wrote a letter to the church of Ephesus when he quotes the letter of Philemon saying how useful it is. Remember, Onesimus means useful. This guy named Ignatius writes to the church of Ephesus saying how useful it is that these letters are put together. It is also a fact that the bishop of Ephesus at the end of the first century was named Onesimus. Now, if Onesimus was about 20 when this all goes down, when he meets Paul, and Paul sends him back, and Philemon frees him, and then Philemon sends him back to serve and be useful to Paul, if he was 20 when that happened, and he goes back and he helps Paul, and he serves a church, and he is then entrusted to serve other churches, he would be about 70 when the, the letters were put together, which would be about the age of a bishop, right? And so, if you were Onesimus, the bishop of Ephesus, and you were putting together the letters of Paul, what would be the one letter you'd make sure was in there? You'd make sure you had Romans, the great theological treatise. You'd make sure you had Galatians, the letter that explained the law and grace. You'd make sure you had Corinthians, because God help them, they're worried about sex and money and food, and we need that advice. But what would be the one letter that you'd put in there? It'd be the letter that made you free. It'd be the letter that made sure that Philemon saw you as a person. Now, it's not certain that that's exactly how it worked out, but we just don't know, do we? Philemon could, with assistance from Paul, imagine a world in which Onesimus is not a slave, is not a thing, is not an object, but is a brother. It is this capability to imagine. It's this capability for Philemon to have how he thinks be shaped by the gospel. I believe that is the ability that Paul picked. Of all the reasons that Paul could have picked him to be a leader in the church, I think that's it. That's the central one. It's not that Philemon was perfect. It's that he was allow himself, his imagination, to be formed by the gospel. Be able to imagine a new way to live. Now, it took some prodding. Paul had to point out the graciousness which Paul had offered him, and maybe Philemon should pass that along. It took Paul showing him that Onesimus was finally living up to his name as useful now that he was following Jesus. It took Paul offering to make the sacrifice himself and to cover the debts of this person. But together, it worked out such that Philemon could see something he had not seen before. He didn't see Onesimus the slave. He saw Onesimus the person, the brother, and one day, maybe even the bishop. <laughs>
can we do the same? Can we have our imaginations be, show, be so shaped by the gospel that we do not see what is broken, we do not see what is painful, but we are willing to offer ourselves sacrificially for others, especially the people that we wince whenever we see? Amen.